Good evening. Good evening. Can, whoa, okay. <laughs> no one ever answers when I talk. That's great. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. We're pleased to have you all here on a frigid Las Vegas evening. Maybe not quite frigid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm frigid. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've got a great talk tonight. Uh, it's negotiating with terrorists or defeating them, counterinsurgency and reconciliation lessons from Colombia, Afghanistan, and Somalia. And we have our Brookings colleague, Vonda Felbab Brown, out tonight. And when she says, uh, talks about lessons, it's not abstract academic lessons just written from reading books and studying in libraries. Vonda spent years on the ground in these countries some of the most dangerous places in the world, figuring out what's going on and why. And we're delighted to have her back to give us her perspective on that tonight. I'm going to take a moment to recognize, as you all know, all our guests here are special, but we have a slightly more special guest tonight. And that's former university president Don Snyder. We're happy to have you here. <laughs> Don was just over at the uh, groundbreaking for the new Hospitality Hall, the new building that will house our hotel college here on campus. So let me thank you on behalf of the entire university and community for helping bring another incredible asset to our region. And this if you... This is an incredible asset we're celebrating tonight. Brooking, uh, what we do for the university and the community is a big, is big deal. So. You, you said that just the way I wrote it for you. Thank you, very much. <laughs> thank you sir. Uh, if you could do me one favor and just try and get your guests to behave themselves tonight, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can only do so. <laughs> okay. uh, let me tell you a little bit about Vonda. She's a senior fellow at Brookings in, and, uh, in foreign policy and works with the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. So she's an expert, as you might expect, on international and internal conflicts, including insurgency, organized crime, urban violence, illicit economies. She spoke to us on her most recent trip out here on illicit water economies, which, and that was a fascinating talk. We invited her back to talk about uh, an important topic, and even more so in, in this election season and in this political climate, and given the horrible events we see happening with much more frequency around the world. So I know you'll have questions for her, uh, and they're always good ones, as you know, Vonda. So I will leave this group in your good hands. Uh, good evening. It's um, really a pleasure to be back. Um, there are many reasons why I've been coming back. Uh, uh, one is uh, Bill and the Brookings um, uh, Center and the, the colleagues here, but also um, the interlocutors um, that I have encountered. And so I'm really delighted to be here, uh, delighted to be enjoying the blooming desert. I tried spending um, some time today and yesterday walking around the Zeris Cape and really admiring it and getting great sense of rejuvenation from it, despite the cold weather. That's a uh, little bit disappointing, I must confess. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's of course, uh, I'm joking, it's of course a great pleasure to be here. When uh, we, uh, some months ago with Bill, were picking the topics and thinking about the, the title of my talk, um, I was at the time more hopeful that in fact we would see far greater progress uh, in um, some of the key negotiations in places uh, such as Afghanistan, Somalia and um, Colombia. And so the title is Lessons, but the lessons are um, very unfinished. And in fact, the outcomes have been more or less um, quite disappointing. The Colombia is the most optimistic place, but even um, in the, uh, that case, we, uh, the international community and the Colombian government uh, just missed a very important um, uh, deadline last week where uh, the government had hoped uh, for months that uh, March 26th would be the moment when it announced the deal with the leftist guerrilla, the FARC, and that did not pan out. Um, and I'll come back to that um, in just a little bit, and, and we can also uh, reflect in um, the conversation after how useful or not it is to set these kind of deadlines. Uh, 
Overall, however, I would say that um, perhaps with the exception of Colombia, which had, had some very important uh, progress, certainly both Afghanistan and Somalia are places of disappointed expectations. And um, those are not just disappointed expectations compared to, say, five years ago or compared to the beginning of some breakthroughs in the conflict, but um, in a much more immediate, um, say, one-year sense. And the role of um, negotiations or defeating terrorists has been um, in different ways tried in all three places. So I'll start with um, Colombia uh, and then talk about Afghanistan and Somalia. Let me um, preface it at the beginning that Colombia is the place where there is perhaps the greatest chance that negotiations will succeed, at least in the formal sense of ending conflict. Uh, despite the fact that the deadline was just missed and there is not immediate clarity as to what will happen. In Afghanistan, um, we are almost in a situation where uh, after a decade and a half of um, state building and uh, counterinsurgency efforts, uh, the Afghan government and perhaps even the international community is clinging to the notion of negotiations as a desperation way out. And that has uh, not worked. Uh, we, the negotiations have really not gotten off the ground. And even should they get off the ground, it's almost guaranteed they will not produce any um, even um, breakthrough in terms of a table agreement anytime soon. <coughs> and by soon, I mean a few years. And uh, then there is Somalia, where uh, the notion of negotiating with the terrorist group there, the, the Shabaab, um, has never been on the table. Uh, the, neither the Somali uh, government nor the international community have thought that this is the direction they would head. And instead, the, the notion has been that the group will simply be defeated on the battlefield. And in fact, what we have seen over the past year is uh, rejuvenation of the group. And I use the term rejuvenation um, on purpose here because the, the, the word Shabaab means youth. Now, the group might not be so young as it calls itself anymore, but um, in fact, they are experiencing um, strengthening. And uh, that's uh, sad for many reasons, um, including because we are just, uh, I guess, a day or two away from the um, anniversary of a very horrific terrorist attack in Garissa, where Shabaab entered uh, 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 northern Somali, uh, a northern Kenyan town uh, called Garissa, where there is an important regional university, and massacred um, um, over uh, 100 students and faculty. And so we are on the year of that anniversary and with very little progress and significant deterioration along several, not all, but several dimensions in the country. So let me start uh, to warm us up with the most uh, promising one, although even that one is difficult, and that's Colombia. Colombia has been caught up in some form of violent military conflict for um, over seven decades. In the, since the 50s, the, the form of that conflict has included the contestation between the uh, Colombian government and several leftist guerrilla groups. The most important one uh, is the, the FARC. The second most important one is the, the ELN. And uh, th until the early 2000s decade, the FARC um, was getting quite a bit of strength and gathering momentum. The 1990s were a period quite dire when the Colombian government tried negotiating at the time with the FARC. The negotiations turned out a farce. Neither side was really committed. The FARC used the negotiations to greatly strengthen itself by taxing uh, the coca the, uh, and cocaine industries in the country, but also through um, other mechanisms. And uh, the negotiation collapsed after three years of, of just no progress and greatly soured uh, the Colombian um, society on the concept of negotiations. And certainly the, the Col Colombian politicians found it extraordinarily risky. Starting in the late 1990s, the, um, as, as the negotiations first dragged on and then collapsed, 
the United States government um, engaged in um, uh, very robust um, assistance efforts to Colombia, particularly um, military um, support efforts that also had a significant counter-narcotics component to um, um, spray to destroy the, the drug um, economy in Colombia, both to limit the influx of drugs to the United States and to take money away from the FARC. That counter-drug element didn't work, and in my view was counterproductive along many different dimensions. However, um, Colombia, after decades of, uh, after years of trying, uh, turned out to be one of the biggest success stories of U.S. military assistance efforts. And the Colombian military was really greatly turned around from a very weak, unmotivated force that uh, the FARC could run circles around to a force that significantly beat back the, the FARC um, um, between 2002 and 2007. And then since 2007, we have seen essentially a stalemated war uh, in which the FARC is much weaker than it was in 98. And that was one of the impetus driving the FARC to the negotiation uh, table. Um, but nonetheless, where the, the Colombian government just could not deliver the lethal punch, uh, despite trying for several years, and just could not completely eliminate the FARC. And the FARC you know, has perhaps still 8,000 um, soldiers. The numbers are very unclear, and this is almost an eternal statistic. Every year is 8,000 soldiers, and one needs to question that, but um, not an insignificant uh, number. So when the current government of uh, President uh, Santos came to power, interestingly enough, he used to be a defense minister during the, uh, the 2000s decades of the push against the FARC, he was very brave in um, engaging in a big political gambit uh, to start negotiating with the FARC. And um, the negotiations moved further along than many Colombian negotiations, certainly the previous one. And even though the, the deal was not reached a few days ago at, at the time of the deadline, uh, I am nonetheless rather optimistic that a deal will be reached. There are several components of the deal, um, five uh, essential ones. Um, and agreements have already been reached um, on three of them. Um, nonetheless, uh, many of the tough elements were bracketed and um, they are yet to be resolved. And moreover, for months now, uh, well over half a year, the uh, negotiations were stuck uh, on, on two crucial issues. Uh, one is the disarmament and the mobilization of the FARC. And the other is its um, um, political future. So because the FARC doesn't feel anywhere near defeated enough, if you'd like, uh, they don't want to simply surrender. Their view of the negotiation is that they will transform the um, military struggle into a political one. They are also very reluctant to accept any sort of punishment for um, serious crimes that the FARC has engaged in or any notions of, of imprisonment. And so the government was quite clever in um, um, uh, reaching a, a, a previous deal on, on the issue of, um, of um, the, the, the punishment of the, of the consequences of um, massive human rights violations, as uh, defining um, imprisonment or, or jail time, perhaps not even actually involving a physical jail. And that allowed uh, that element of the, uh, of the negotiations to, to um, be agreed to in September of last year. However, uh, where the government is now struggling, and the reason why the deal did not move forward um, uh, on March 26 is that the FARC envisions that the areas where it will demobilize will be large zones where it can politically um, mobilize. And uh, that they will be defined, in fact, as those areas of its confinement. But that the confinement will mean full uh, uh, political activity. And it accuses the government of trying to define those areas as very limited in physical space, trying to prevent the political mobilization there. And in fact, as 
um, as creating out of a small physical space a, a, a prison without the, the building the structure. The government, however, does not want to accept the notion that these areas will be free zones for the FARC to, to mobilize politically and that the punishment is much more than simply having a political future there. So this is one of the key uh, points of contention at the level of leadership. But of course what is happening is that both the FARC and the government have to do um, many other forms of negotiations, including within their in-group. So, so the outreach by, by Santos is highly politically um, controversial in uh, Colombia. The right, is the right side of the political spectrum represented by the former president Uribe is deeply opposed to it, has um, multiple times attempted to subvert it, will likely look for mechanisms to do so. And the Colombian military is also deeply unsure about what kind of um, future with the FARC, what kind of coexistence, if any, they want to accept. Moreover, there is also a loose actor or many loose actors, which are the so-called um, uh, criminal groups or, or, or neo-paramilitary groups that emerged out of the wake of demobilizing a much more formalized paramilitary group that used to fight the FARC and it was created specifically to fight the FARC. So the, the, that group was demobilized in 2006. Its leaders faced punishment, some of them are still in jail and accepted in fact more, far more robust terms of, um, of um, uh, punishment than the, the FARC has accepted so far. But nonetheless, many groups emerged out of them that continue engaging in criminal behavior, which try to take over municipal governments, at least indirectly, usurp public and private resources, and also really hate the FARC to death and will attempt to, uh, to push the, any demobilized FARC out of the areas where they operate. So uh, the Santos government needs to not only negotiate with the FARC, they need to negotiate with the political um, space in Colombia and they need to find a way to um, assure the FARC that they can control the paramilitary groups. And of course they cannot easily do that because they don't in fact have good control over them. Now to Santos's credit, far more than his predecessor, he has tried to combat and dismantle the groups, but there are perhaps 10,000 of them again, uh, 10,000 actual members, not groups. Conversely, however, the FARC, needs to, the FARC leadership needs to negotiate with um, its own ranks, with, with its own middle-level commanders, who don't like the idea necessarily of demobilization, uh, whose existence often has been defined uh, and experienced only by the military struggle, who are hardly exhausted by it, really can Im imagine a different life, perhaps profit from many criminal aspects of the fight, and who also are deeply uncertain about what kind of um, future they can have in a war uh, absent uh, or, or in a <coughs> outside of war. They don't have any economic skills, whatever, and um, their, their political future is very uncertain because the FARC's base is a very small group of rural population. So if they compete in elections, they will most likely be defeated for many years unless they transform themselves and, and perhaps die at the ballot. So they are not sure they want to buy into this bargain. Nonetheless, I believe that for both sides, there is substantial commitment and substantial lack of alternatives that a deal is likely. Um, one of the things that I think could derail it is if the deal didn't take place while Santos is still in power and a successive government will not have the same commitments and will find it easier to walk away, especially a rightist government. Um, and of course, you can have inadvertent collapse and there have been multiple incidents in which the political space constrained that the, the election, that the negotiation just seemed to be falling through. But I think more likely than not, there will be a deal. But in, that in many ways is only the start. The deeper transformation, the addressing of the root causes of the historic neglect, marginalization and development of the Colombian rural spaces and, and urban slums, which um, are giving um, sustainment to the FARC and, and which were the sources in many ways of decades of other forms of conflict yet are to be addressed. 
And it's not clear that the Colombian state and society will have the wherewithal to do so, including because it's very resource uh, intensive. And so, you know, middle class people, but even say lower up, up uh, people who are uh, lower upper, lower middle class people who are progressing, uh, are questioning: Should we be giving money to the slum? Should we be giving money to these coca-infested territories? Our taxes, or do we want to spend it on other issues? And so it's not at all clear that even with peace, uh, or with, even with a peace deal, that will in fact become the transformation that will be peace. Nonetheless, that's the hopeful story. The um, far less hopeful story is Afghanistan, where um, just about no trend is going well over the uh, past year and a half, um, really since the beginning of 2015 when the um, international community substantially altered um, its presence and significantly reduced um, its military, um, military presence in the country. The US has about 10,000 soldiers there, uh, the international community about 12,000, uh, uh, another 2,000, so 12,000 altogether. And the Obama administration came in, um, I think, with hope and determination that they will um, extricate the US from the Afghanistan entanglement in a way that was quite parallel, though not often expressed in the same way that President Obama spoke about Iraq. And uh, he has not accomplished that. The, the war is more intense than it has been. Um, last year, more Afghans died at any point uh, in the conflict since uh, 2001. The Taliban is facing um, many internal challenges and uh, is facing fragmentation since last July in a way that it has not experienced since 94, when, when the group emerged. But nonetheless, they're deeply entrenched. The military momentum is on their side. They have been, um, um, they, they have um, accrued significant tactical um, successes uh, since last summer that continue um, um, all this spring. And um, uh, uh, again, the, the view of the government is one of trying to negotiate a way out of the conflict with the sense that um, there is no other way out of the conflict, uh, quite bordering. And perhaps that the word desperation is uh, somewhat of a misstatement. It might also well be a wisdom in understanding that it's not simply possible to defeat the Taliban on the battlefield. But the Taliban clearly is negotiating, or more precisely, not negotiating from very much of a position of strength and momentum. The Afghan military and police forces are going through multiple challenges. We see um, um, significant defection, talk of um, ghost um, soldiers, low morale, and deep persisting problems of um, logistics, support, um, air, um, air support, other support and um, um, uh, still quite significant dependence on support of the international community, particularly the United States. Not merely in the sense of um, paying for the Afghan uh, security forces, which is entirely footed by the international community. The Afghan state cannot pay for itself and, and has no prospect of paying for itself, but in terms of immediate um, physical operations. But of course, we have very significantly reduced presence there. And one of the reasons why the security, security situation deteriorated so significantly is because there are no more international US soldiers on whom the <coughs> Afghan uh, military can lean in the same way. Now, I, I don't want to imply that the Taliban is about to take Kabul tomorrow. And in fact, the Taliban is quite well aware that they don't have the capacity to do so and that uh, they likely face the prospect of very protracted, difficult civil war that would be playing Kabul and North. And they understand how disastrous that would be for them and, and would like to avoid that scenario. But right now, despite repeated outreach from the Afghan government, um, they have not been willing to engage in negotiations for at least a year. Why not? Well, I think that one is both a sense that the momentum is on their side and that they can wait out the international community until the end of this year. 
and um, there are yet big decisions to be made about what kind of uh, international military presence and other presence that will be in the country. It looks like right now that the U.S. will retain about 5,000 soldiers there and presumably other NATO partners will return, retain some soldiers there as well. Um, the, the European governments, particularly Germany, have been far more willing to uh, stay in the um, conflict than even, say, four years ago, three, three, four years ago, because of the influx of Afghan refugees to Europe. Afghan refugees are the second largest groups after the Syrians. Um, last year they were uh, about 180,000. And um, uh, the European governments don't want them. And so they hope that the way to stop the refugees from coming is to try to redress the um, uh, difficult conditions in Afghanistan. And so they, they don't want to leave the conflict fully. And they want also the U.S. not to leave the, the conflict so that they don't f see a greater uh, flow of refugees. Nonetheless, the, the European governments have <coughs> labeled the refugees as economic refugees, not as um, security refugees, so they don't have to um, um, even adjudicate whether to provide asylum or not. Uh, so if they are economic refugees, then there are not obligations, uh, legal human rights obligations, to even consider providing asylum. And of course, many are indeed economic refugees, but the economy intersects with the security in ways that cannot be divorced from each other, and in ways that are, again, multiple. Uh, Afghanistan was experiencing um, substantial levels of growth in much of the past decade, over 10%. But a lot of that growth was both based on, and much of it involved, investment from Afghan diaspora community coming back, and as well as from, from others. But much of it was based on hope that um, the security would remain much better than it had. Moreover, much of the economy was also uh, wrapped up with the presence of Afghan, uh, of the international forces. So many young Afghans uh, would work as translators, drivers, cultural advisors, uh, work on bases to clean or to, to feed the troops. And with the departure of tens of thousands of international troops, these jobs are gone. And you have a very uncertain security uh, and political environment in Afghanistan. And so the economy has gone down from growing 12, 14, 15 percent a year to two uh, to something percent a year, which of course for a tremendously poor country with huge youth bulge is nowhere sufficient to keep employing people. So unemployment has gone up, um, sources of income have gone down, uh, the Afghan military remains one of the few uh, employment opportunities available to people, but it's a bad investment for a family if the chance is very high that um, the son uh, will uh, die. And so many Afghans for years would send one son to the Taliban, one son to the military, and perhaps one son to the local militias to hedge and have some survival strategy coping mechanisms depending on how it would end up in local environment. Um, far more so people in rural areas than, than in urban spaces. But that, that this coping strategy of dividing the risks um, is no longer equally viable for people because the casualties on um, particularly the side of the government have been, have been so large, <coughs> potentially unsustainable. On the other hand, um, the Taliban's uh, own very limiting strategy is that uh, they have been extremely callous in how they treat their own soldiers. And even when they don't engage in, in suicide missions of the sense that people will blow themselves up, lots of the operations that they are being sent to, it's clear they will not walk away back from them. Nonetheless, we have not seen the Taliban not being able to recruit people. And the, the overlay to um, the difficult economic situation and security situation is continual very um, fractious uh, politics in Afghanistan, with uh, the political elite still being very narrowly self-interested in 
power and profit maximization and willing to rock the system and constantly engage in brinksmanship, they don't necessarily want to topple the country over into civil war, but part of the, their calculation is that this will in fact not happen, and that so they can all the time push it to the brink. The consequence is, of course, that governance is not taking place and the political system is just consumed by political brinksmanship and manipulation, even as the country is literally on fire. And who knows, one day they might miscalculate in really pushing the country over. I also need to um, emphasize that there is a very important international dimension to the uh, Afghan conflict. Um, even far more so than the case of Colombia with Pakistan, um, the presumed strategic partner of the United States, uh, being also a major source of pain and difficulty for the United States and Afghanistan, and um, supporting the Taliban. Pakistan has not broken with that strategy, despite the horrific terrorist attacks in Pakistan itself, including the one in Lahore. And indeed, um, what the government would do for reasons as much of its duplicity, as much as its own weakness and inability, is to go only against some terrorist groups, those that attack Pakistan, but not go after the Afghan Taliban. The, the government um, military forces, it's much more so the, the military, intelligence military establishment that is the real player rather than the civilian government. Um, is very afraid that if they start going after the Afghan Taliban as well, they will provoke yet another force to engage in um, terrorist attacks and uh, militancy in Pakistan. But also, they're very uncertain as to what will happen in Afghanistan. They don't trust the, the non-Taliban government. They don't trust the United States. And so they want to have an actor proxy the, the Taliban. So the, the government, um, uh, the Afghan government has repeatedly and particularly uh, in the current form of President Ashraf Ghani reached out to Pakistan and hoped that Pakistan would deliver the Taliban to the negotiating table and more than that, that it would make the Taliban to sign an acceptable deal. And Pakistan has done neither. And frankly, I don't think they have the capacity to do either. They clearly have the capacity to make the Taliban's life far more difficult to um, uh, not provide the same level of sanctuary and outright support, uh, but they, have, they are hardly the perfect master. The Taliban has its own agenda, the guy, Pakistan doesn't control it, and they, they cannot do what the international community hopes it will do. They can do much more than they're doing, but they cannot make the Taliban sign the deal, and frankly, they have proved unable to bring the Taliban to the, to the table. I'm quite aware of time, so let me uh, just say um, only very few words about Somalia to um, uh, allow some um, space for um, conversation. One is that um, in Somalia the negotiations were never on the table and the hope was that um, an international military force, multilateral force operating under the, the heading of the African Union mission will sufficiently be beat back uh, Shabab. That, that force called Amisom struggled for many years, but then finally in 2011 seemed to make big progress and really pushed out Shabab from Mogadishu, from other territories, weakened its um, financial base. But nonetheless, that conflict has been stalled, uh, the, the, the battlefield has been stalled um, for about two years and, and Shabab is making significant comeback. They cannot, like the Taliban, or even less than the Taliban, they can take over territories and control territories. The Taliban's been able to do that recently. Uh, but uh, it can generate enough insecurity to uh, prevent governance by the government. And um, the Amisom force itself is very ineffective, very divided, with very limited capacities, very much in a garrison mode. Uh, not really engage in active operations. And so often they, they operate in spaces nominally cleared of uh, Shabab, but in practice Shabab rules far more than the night. The other important actors, or, or many other important actors in the Somali context are various clan militias or militias around particular power brokers 
which are a force in some ways more robust. Um, the problem is that it's also a force, uh, not that they are forces, there are many of them, that uh, can be so vicious and predatory in its behavior that they continue creating the root causes for, Talab for uh, Shabab's uh, presence. Good example is the, uh, the power broker in southern um, Somalia called um, Sheikh Madobe, former high-level uh, Shabab commander who defected and created an anti-Shabab militia, has been a very potent force there. But he so discriminates against uh, smaller clans and, and um, engages in land theft um, and other resource usurpation that the Shabab finds it quite easy then to turn to those um, uh, marginalized clans as, as its support base. Uh, Madobe is also, for many reasons, uh, the favorite proxy of the Kenyan Defense Force that operates uh, in Somalia. And um, that is a very uh, complex, if not outright problematic, actor. But it's a far more potent force than, for example, the Burundi forces there, whose arguably biggest contribution of being there is that they don't join the ethnic infighting in their own country. So the international community is essentially paying them to sit there so they don't kill each other or engage in fighting back in Burundi. And so once again, even though the, the, there has not been a vision of negotiations with the Shabaab, there has been very much of a vision of negotiating between the um, Somali government and the Somali people. And that negotiation have, where to take place or is taking place through a presumed constitutional um, reform, through the creation of states within Somalia to devolve power from Mogadishu to local areas with the hope that the local elites will be more responsive and accountable to interests of the people and less discriminatory, as well as um, <coughs> with, with elections to take place um, this year. It's clear now that the hope of the one man, one vote elections will not take place. Once again, the elections will follow an essentially clan-based appointment formula with all the same problems, uh, uh, political paralysis, and um, very parochial-based politics that we have seen before. And the, the um, hope is now that uh, something more resembling uh, one man, one vote elections, um, one woman, um, uh, would take place in 2020. As a side note, women's groups are actually surprisingly very powerful, effective players. And I say surprisingly because one can have an image of, of um, uh, Somalia as not just very poor, but also very man-dominated. And of course, the, the jihadi um, uh, narrative is of one of subjugation of women. But women's groups are very important um, actors in, in Somalia. But civil society has been marginalized. The current government is extremely disappointing. Uh, many are looking to see its back and hope that the appointment process, uh, election process, will deliver some better rule. Um, I think that the formations of the state are the, the, is the most, um, is the most um, encouraging element. And in many ways, a lot of Shabab activity is about subverting that state formation process below Mogadishu level. However, what's uh, been discouraging um, is that the elites operating at the newly formed states, not just Madoba, but in other areas, often engage in the same um, rapacious, predatory, um, infighting politics. And that what's being devolved is this mode of politics rather than accountability. Which brings me to uh, the, the last sentence, um, which is that the key difficulty for the United States or, or the, the, the Rosetta Stone of foreign engagement to be cracked is how do we alter uh, the uh, interest of local elites, national elites, to be more indeed in the mode of national reconciliation and coexistence. Because wars, uh, protracted wars, often strengthen and reinforce systems of very narrow parochial politics. It's an old adage that there is a lot of money to be made out of war. There is also a lot of power to be made out of war. And um, the problem of uh, US 
um, effort in assisting state building is often one of not being able to get the elites in Afghanistan, in um, Somalia, to uh, be, um, to, to put some level of national interest ahead of just personal power and money. Uh, that, uh, let me um, open it for um, questions and conversation. With, with, with such a high level of corruption in Mogadishu, uh, in Kabul, in all these other places, it almost legitimizes these governments. How can, can they go ahead and, and maintain some central government to try to overcome all these different problems? Oh, absolutely. And uh, in both cases, um, the reason why the militant groups like Taliban and Shabab, which are in many ways terribly unappealing, have been able to persist for so long is because of corruption um, in, in two ways. One is that corruption um, um, really alienates people. The, the optics of it is very bad. The sense of um, um, alienation and injustice is great, but also because corruption can in fact hamper functionality. And in both uh, Somalia and Afghanistan, it deeply hampers functionality of even minimal security forces. So a lot of the weakness, the strength of the Taliban, for example, is in fact weakness of Afghan units because of corruption, not necessarily even political divisions, different groups against each other, but just purely personal corruption. The way you become a captain is you pay several tens of thousands of dollars to get that position as opposed to being based on merit. Um, and so the US in, and the international community in both places has tried to uh, um, develop mechanisms to reduce, overcome that corruption. Of course, the international community is often rightly um, accused of also perpetuating the corruption, including by the way large international funds are injected in the country, and, and sometimes by outright explicit bargains that a nasty local warlord is better than the, the, the Shabab or Taliban. So yes, that's, that's very much the, the key dynamic underneath is, um, and, and you know, there are many different forms of corruption. I think the, 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 the most debilitating forms are those that are very, that are discriminatory against outright communities along communal lines, ethnic lines, clan lines, which we see in both places. But also that um, then really prevent elemental functions of the government. So one form of corruption is to another form of taxation. So I will get a license from the government, say in India or Russia, if I pay on top of the stated fee another $10. That's not good. But nonetheless, as long as then the service is delivered, the cost of that service is higher, it might not be efficient, it might still be outrageous, but something gets done. The, the problem with corruption in places like Somalia or, or Afghanistan is that you pay the bribe and you still don't get what you necessarily need to get. And, and the, the government <coughs> stops functioning even along elemental lines. How does that get cured? Um, well, the internationals have not been able to crack it from the outside. I think that essentially the elites need to come to a set of reckoning with themselves that uh, it's either some reform, some restraint of corruption and parochialism, or it, it's over. Uh, whether the over is international support, withdrawal of the international community, no more money, or whether it's fall over into civil war. <coughs> but they often are willing to risk the consequences or discount the consequences. Yes, uh, well, that, that's a uh, very interesting talk again. In, in this whole process of, uh, <coughs> I know in our early founding, the whole process of separation of church and state, but I think there's such an important aspect of separating business and economics from state and religion mm -hmm. too. And uh, that was also confronted in our early years. Britain was so dominant in our economics. How are we going to be able to get economic independence, be on our own, um, how to work on those things and help with uh, 
development of, of individuals or certain, you, you, know, you mentioned water and water development, electricity, but I guess, you know, you see Kurdistan, I know you didn't talk about that, but what about the concept of trying to work on a federalism too that says, okay, you don't have to completely give up your regional power. You know, again, essentially that's what we had to go through. We fought a big war over it, but anyway. Yeah, so well, is there any way to... Th that is uh, very much the prescription for um, Somalia. And it's not just abstract prescription based on other countries like U.S. history, but also because what seemed to work in Somalia most since 91 are precisely local forms of governance that can be quite localized indeed, often at the city level. It's almost like what would function would be particular cities perhaps some, some smaller rural areas. And so hence the, the prescription was the evolution of power taking place in Somalia in the form of federalism. The states are now forming. Um, and it would be very premature to say that we know that, whether that has worked or not, that many of the states are still being formed. And both the Shabab push, but also other forms of infighting are over how those states will be defined with both their physical boundaries, but also power resource relations with Mogadishu and within the state itself. Uh, so that's the hope. Right now, what is disappointing is that some of the same bad clan rivalries um, and um, parochial politics, discriminatory self-interested politics, uh, utterly self-interested politics, are also taking place at the, at the level of the newly formed states. And that in fact, the, the governance there seems to be worse than at some of the previous um, city level. Now, is it just a phase? Will they grow out of that? Um, who, who knows? Um, you know, it's, it's early days, um, and in some cases, literally days for the state that are being formed. Uh, but the problem is that none of the states are just one clan. Uh, Somalia is an extremely fractured place down to the point that people will not be able to identify what their supra clan. Many might say, well, we are part of the sub clan, but we really don't know how it relates to, um, to um, other clans. But so none of the states being formed are just singular entity, but just the same patronage network. And of course, there is competition. And, and the competition right now is being played out, again, in nasty counterproductive ways. Again, will that stop? Um, perhaps. Um, but that's what we see right now. In Afghanistan, um, th uh, the international community often proposes federalism to Afghans. They hate the idea. Um, uh, in that way, is Afghanistan is quite different than Pakistan, where um, Pakistan, for a long time, had the strong functioning state, but did not have a sense of nationhood at all. And the different groups, the Punjabs versus uh, the Sindh, for example, are um, very um, um, unconnected to each other and often quite, they really don't have a sense of being Pakistanis. That surprisingly is quite different in Afghanistan where Afghans do actually have a very strong sense of being Afghans, even as they are also Pashtuns or Tajik or particular subgroups of both of those banks. The Afghanistan's problem has been the other one, the eternal weakness or lack of state, or lack of functioning state. Um, and uh, the history of Afghanistan is history of contestation between the weak center and the, um, the provinces. Um, with the, the center trying to become stronger and often overreaching or alienating local rule um, enough to then not being able to sustain uh, the bargain. But nonetheless, Afghans do not like the idea of federalism. They often, and there are moves to devolve more power to local communities. Um, after, after 2001, the um, Karzai, Ahmed Karzai, the previous president, and the international community created a very centralized state that linked to centralize dysfunction and frustration. But well, although there is acceptance that power should be devolved, they don't want it to be devolved in the form of federalism. In Afghanistan, they will devolve through other mechanisms. Now, you know, perhaps that can become almost a uh, play in names rather than substance, but that solution has not gained traction. <laughs>
But equally, uh, unlike, say, uh, in the case of Kurdistan, Afghans all over hate the idea of dividing the country, even just de facto dividing the country. And Afghanistan has never experienced separatism. They have experienced a lot of fighting and war over who controls the center. But it was not like um, Herat has tried to secede and join Iran or, or become an independent entity, for example. But, but yes, those very, very sort of fundamental issues of political order are still being contested and um, uh, contested militarily and have been for a long time. Please. Afghanistan, and I agree, it, it will never, I don't think it will ever see a federal, strong federalism. Uh, the, the country is really uh, historically tribal-centered. And it, it, I get the impression that the United States doesn't really know the, the interrelationships, the alliances and the hostilities between the different tribes and the support given to one warlord is not recognized as what it means by virtue of other alliances that tribe may have. Could you address the tribal issue? I think that in many ways that is often the case and one of the things that is um, interesting and very frustrating about Afghanistan is that many conflicts have immediate manifestations but then you find out that although they're wrapped in larger issue of say political contestations or identities sometime in 1920s someone from one village murdered someone else and that has there are still those roots and antecedents of the conflict today in ways that can elude analysts or or international governments for years to come so i think on one level that's very much the case on another level however i also believe that it's easy to overplay the tribal, non-modern aspect of, of Afghanistan. And that it's easier to overplay it in multiple ways. So on the one hand, people fall back on the tribal identity, often because other sources of, of uh, economic and political progress are not available. On the other hand, however, people don't necessarily like that. And so after 2001, with all the strong tribal identity and big issues of sense of Pashtun marginalization and driving conflict being there, no doubt. But then uh, people really look to, toward the national government. They wanted to eclipse the very narrow parochial um, politics. But the national government didn't deliver that. The national government only in different ways transmuted the, the parochial politics and, and <coughs> corruption. But there was a strong desire to, to escape out of that, uh, that level of um, uh, political dictates of one's life. Moreover, again, the tribal identity competes with other identities, including nationalism, which is far stronger in Afghanistan than, for example, in, in Pakistan. But the other issue is that um, one of the reasons why the Taliban has been so successful is that it could move beyond the tribal identity, and in fact, even beyond the ethnic identity. And so especially, to, although Pashtuns are the biggest group, the biggest element of the Taliban, one of the reasons they, they knocked su such serious punches in the north over the past year is because they recruited the Tajiks. They, they, they are very good into tapping into the sense of a group being marginalized and then turning that into its advantage, and although they are Pashtuns and often, often caric are caricatured, but also encourage the notion of being the, the authentic voice of the Pashtun community. And although they have been very discriminatory toward the Hazaras, for example, and really slaughtered many of the Hazaras, they nonetheless can also portray themselves in pan tribal in the ways that many politicians can. Many politicians look far more, uh, far more parochial and far more narrow than even the Taliban is able to do. Just a terrible indictment if you think about it, that you know, a group as brutal and as backward as the Taliban still comes across more generous in some ways than a, a politician would. 
Um, but the other issue that I would mention is that many of the tribal structures have withered and are battered in, in Afghanistan. And so there are tribes and tribal identities and very broadly tribal system of patronage and support and perhaps tribal systems of prosecuting one's daily existence. But nonetheless, lots of the traditional elders are gone. They were killed by conflict or they died out. And the key problem for Afghanistan is that the state, the national state, the modern institutional state is not formed, while the traditional forms of rule have also collapsed. And now, you know, I don't want to say that there are no more Maliks in Afghanistan, that all tribal structures are gone. That's obviously an understatement. But they are much, much weaker than, say, in the 70s, 60s, 50s. And so they don't deliver um, a lot of the necessary governance um, uh, that people need. And then groups like the Taliban uh, or even warlords can um, step into that lacuna, often perform poorly. But nonetheless, there is a lacuna at the level of tribal structure. Do you see any hope for any of these places? <laughs> uh, uh, well, so I, as I said, I, I am far more optimistic about Colombia, not, not just then in comparison with Sol Sol Somalia and Afghanistan, but also in comparison with itself. I think that Colombia today is a much more hopeful place than Colombia in 2007 or 2010. I think that the, 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 there is more of movement toward national reconciliation and toward movement, movement toward empathy, toward fellow citizens, fellow residents, than there has been many times or, or most of the time characterized Colombian history. I don't think it's perfect, I don't think it's done, I'm not persuaded that it's sufficient, but it's more hopeful. You know, I, um, I mean, I. I I am sad and disappointed both about Afghanistan and Somalia, but I also fundamentally don't subscribe to the notion that either place or such places are condemned to eternal conflict and that they'll never break out um, of um, um, pernicious politics and, and military conflict. Um, European history is one of wars that go on for decades um, and eventually countries, peoples break out of them. So in that very long sense, I am hopeful for both places. Um, in the immediate sense, I, I am not optimistic. I'm less optimistic than I was in both places a year or two ago. Um, and I'm also not optimistic um, that the United States, the international communities have ready solutions. And, and, and that any of the range of potential forms of engagement really provide a clear light as to how to get a more satisfactory outcome. But in my view, that doesn't mean that we should disengage. Now, engaging does not necessarily mean military engagement, does not necessarily mean force present. I would quite be ready to call that a day um, in Afghanistan if we see further misbehavior of the elite and um, the military. I, I don't think this, I don't have that as a prescription right now, but I would, despite being a supporter of Afghanistan and its people for a long time, my uh, judgment and patience is running out on that to some extent, even though it hasn't run out. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that I believe that, that the US should and perhaps even can just to retreat to a fortress America. And if, um, of course, the US is not Europe, there are many differences, but the, the ISIS attacks um, just drive home that uh, in today's world, the uh, conflicts and difficulties in one place rarely are isolated to that place and that they have other repercussions. And so we need to be patient and we need to be much smarter in, what, in how we engage. And again, that might not mean boots on the ground. And it might also be very well that um, our strength needs to be to pull back from that kind of engagement at some point. To, to, uh, your, to, to the last point that you made, uh, uh, you talk about the dysfunction in all three countries in different degrees. Uh, uh, but uh, so far, it's been manifested more in, inside the borders of each of those countries. What, what is the risk 
that they export the dysfunction and how would that manifest itself in your mind? Well, and I need to emphasize that there is a lot of functioning in Colombia. It's, a, it's very different than Somalia or, or Afghanistan. It's a middle income country. It's experiencing far better and sustained economic growth than the rest of Latin America and not the same economic collapse like Brazil, for example. And the elites are very, and not just elites, the uh, Colombian middle class is very internationalized, often very well educated, very potent, effective labor force. So it's a much more functional place. And in fact, the, the, to some extent, the key to Colombia is that parts of it can function extremely well while being quite indifferent to other areas that are caught up in conflict and, um, and marginalization. So in the case of Colombia, the biggest export, the biggest bad that the country was exporting um, have been drugs. And um, the, the FARC has never attempted to uh, attack the United States. Nothing of that kind is in the making. They have periodically kidnapped uh, members of the international business community, as do other actors. Um, but that has never really amounted to anything other than individual threat. And the way the U.S. has tried going about um, combating drugs in Colombia has been ineffective and counterproductive. In Afghanistan, the country exports not just drugs, but of course uh, was the place from which the 9-11 attacks originated. The Taliban um, is conflicted in how much it wants to sever um, any um, contacts or support for um, jihadi groups that would target the international com community, Europe or the United States. Uh, just this past summer, there was a big Al-Qaeda camp found that the US military bombed with uh, arguably plans to attack uh, certainly US assets, if not the United States. And now you have some weak elements of what is calling itself Islamic State in Afghanistan. But the chance that civil war chaos or large territories falling into Taliban hands will again raise the specter of international terrorism, including again, attacks against the US are significant. And um, the, the, I would say even more severe problem is that a very weak, contested, unstable terrorist controlled Afghanistan will destabilize Pakistan, a country with many nuclear weapons, way too many nuclear weapons, and a country with, but it, it, whose collapse would be quite catastrophic, not just for South Asia, but the world. In Somalia, again, there is a lot of t uh, international terrorist activities. Um, Shabab has participated, or members of, uh, of the jihadi groups that would later become Shabab were very complicit in the uh, attack on US uh, um, embassies in Kenya and Tanzania with many US casualties. They have engaged uh, in targeting uh, uh, Kenya. And of course, there have been the cases of Shabab trying to recruit among um, Somali diaspora in Europe and in the United States for potential terrorist attacks. So, They've been attempts, but no, really, nothing, thank God, has, um, has happened. So certainly in the case of Somalia, there is also a real significant possibility of um, um, international terrorist attacks that reach even the U.S. homeland. I always regret this part where I have to cut off our discussion, but I want to be respectful of your time. And thank you, Vanda, for your insights on a very <laughs> complicated topic. As I thank you for attending, let me uh, invite you back in a week. We have another lecture. We'll flip back to the domestic uh, side of things, and we'll have a colleague, Alan Barube, out from Brookings, uh, who's in the Metropolitan Program there and studies cities uh, and, and metropolitan regions. Uh, he'll talk about inequality and mobility in our cities. You may have seen the recent census data uh, Las Vegas, as a metropolitan region, just moved up to the 29th largest metropolitan region in the country. We've passed Kansas City and we'll keep on moving forward. Uh, it showed that we're growing by a thousand people a week. That's births over deaths and also significant in-migration happening again as the uh, economy picks up. So for example, the rest of the state is growing at about a thousand people a year, okay? So think about what that means for the 
city, county, and region we live in, and what our local governance has to do, what our state governance has to do, our relationship to the federal government in that area. Lots of important things to talk about, so I hope you can join us then. And thanks for coming out. Uh, next week, same time, same place. Yes. Thank you so much. That was terrific. <laughs>